The main story of My Friend Pedro is rather upfront and straightforward. There isn't a lot of hidden meaning behind the struggle of the main character, but that doesn't mean there isn't anything else of a narrative substance in the game. In particular, the environments the main character blasts its way through all have some sort of message or statement on issues or ideas in society today. Let's take a moment to break down a few of the statements that these levels could be trying to make. The second stage of the game, an area called District Null, is described by Pedro as an area that was to unite the municipalities under a doctrine that spoke to the spirit of humanity. Buy stuff. With this, the developers are calling attention to the consumerism that dominates the economy of the modern world. With the high availability of materials and the low cost of manufacturing, products are available to the public at prices that are cheaper than they have ever been. That, combined with a populace that has more disposable income than any other time in human history, has led to a dramatic increase in spending. This influx of cash into the economy has only helped enrichen it, creating more companies that are eager to cash in on the lucrative customer base by offering even newer, better, or more robust products to the customer, enticing them to buy these new items and reinforce the cycle. This economic cycle has created an environment where the consumer has more choice than ever of where they can spend their money for the multitude of products that are vying for their attention, to the point where shopping is seen more as a recreational activity instead of something one does in order to obtain necessities. However, the rise in consumerism has also done more than provide greater consumer choice and strengthen the economy. It seems to have created a change in culture as well, particularly in America. Madeline Levine, an American psychologist, has a quote that sums it up pretty well. It's a shift away from values of community, spirituality, and integrity, and towards competition, materialism, and disconnection. By chasing all of these items that we can purchase, we start to associate positive emotions, happiness, joy, comfort, with the sensation of purchasing them, instead of activities like spending time with friends and family, or reading a book, or even using the thing we just bought. As such, when we crave a boost to our feelings, instead of turning to friends or a creative outlet, we just buy more things. A behavior which depletes our finances, crowds our homes with junk, and does nothing to develop ourselves as a person. Thus, we lose value as a person, becoming shallow, vapid, and uninteresting. A good example of this is Christmas, which is conveniently associated with District Null. Christmas is a holiday that is supposed to center on togetherness and compassion, or for some as a religious celebration, but it has been warped by modern society into a holiday where consumers are pressured into purchasing a trinket or token for every single member of their friends and family, as if the best way to show someone you appreciate them is to buy them something. The politicians in the world of My Friend Pedro are another good example of the drawbacks of consumerism. Instead of being concerned with the wants and needs of their constituents, they were concerned with putting this shopping utopia together to line their own pockets or fill their coffers. And their pursuit for material wealth of what's best for the brand led to them being unable to come together and work through the disagreements they had on the font size of the logo, and thus led to the collapse of their project leaving the hollowed out husks of structures that no one wants to take ownership of, which comes with a pretty clear message from the developers. The vapidness of consumerism will never lead to unity in our world. After coming back to reality following his visit with Pedro in his world, the protagonist travels through the sewers that lie beneath the failed district where he meets the hardest of the hardcore gamers. People who are now emotionally stunted due to their exposure of all of the violence in the video games they've played. Here, the developers are calling attention to the scrutiny that video games have drawn in their past. Nearly since their inception, video games have been accused of developing violent tendencies in those that play games, pointing to them as an explanation for a rise in violence in society. But numerous studies centered on the subject have found little to no link between video games and violence, debunking all of the panicked accusations. However, that hasn't stopped them, and accusations about how video games are corrupting the youth of the world continue to this day. 
The developers obviously agree with the results of the studies that have been carried out and have created these ridiculous caricatures of sewer dwelling, ultra violent, incapable of emotion gamers to mock that scrutiny. Yet the caricature of these gamers could also be mocking another part of gamer culture, specifically the arrogance that some hardcore gamers have and the intense passion they can have over their games. There's no denying that there are people out there that are really good at video games. Like really good. And sometimes, with that higher skill level, comes an inflated ego. Those that fall victim to this will oftentimes tease or just downright insult those that are less experienced in a game. The phrase, get good, is a popular example of this. If a newbie asks for advice on a section or level, a hardcore gamer may tell them to get good at the game instead of providing them actual helpful insight gained from their own time playing. Obviously, this isn't too harmful when things are in jest, but it can be downright frustrating to newcomers that just because they asked for help, it opens them up to insults from these people who think they're too good to help. Now for these hardcore gamers, the inflated ego that comes with their skill generally comes with an inflated sense of self-worth from the game itself, to an often passionate degree. They believe that by struggling through the game's challenges and succeeding, they come out a stronger, better, more powerful person, and anyone that doesn't complete the challenges the way they're meant to be completed are weak or unambitious or pathetic. This fire that burns within this group of gamers is probably best exemplified in a now famous tweet from early 2019, tweeted in response to a journalist that used cheats to finish a video game. You cheated not only the game, but yourself. You didn't grow. You didn't improve. You took a shortcut and gained nothing. You experienced a hollow victory. Nothing was risked, and nothing was gained. It's sad you don't know the difference. It perfectly captures the arrogance that is the thought process of these hardcore gamers. It makes for a very uninviting experience for someone just getting into video game fandom, maybe convincing them to give up playing games, which ultimately doesn't benefit anybody. After all, video games get better by more people playing them. By ostracizing the gamers that hold these pretentious views from the rest of society and my friend Pedro, the developers are saying this attitude is one that should be shunned and forgotten, and we should be celebrating and inviting anyone that shares an interest in playing video games. The final level, the internet, pokes some fun at what life is like today with the internet pervading nearly every facet of society. But the true message of the level actually centers on how devastating life would be if control over this amazing technology was centralized under one person or group. There's no denying that the advent of the internet changed human history. Knowledge that could only be gained by traveling to a library and poring over numerous books or journals is now instantly available to anyone with a click of a button. Communications with people across the world that used to take hours or even days now only takes seconds. Ideas that might never have left the town of the dreamer can now be spread to the entire world. The rise of the internet has created so many new industries, technologies, and possibilities, and much of that has to do with the freedom given to the populace to use this amazing resource. However, imagine a scenario where what you could see or do on the internet was strictly controlled, where you could only view things that those in control wanted you to see. It could restrict your ability to educate yourself, taking away the power that could come with gaining knowledge. There wouldn't be any differing viewpoints or stances on any issues, just the one put forth by the administration controlling the dissemination of information. With only having one source to consume information of, you could lose the ability to be skeptical, to question or criticize. You would be unconsciously placated into submission, brainwashed into believing that there are no problems with the way the world works, that life is perfect, and there aren't any ways to improve, and anybody that thinks differently from you is dangerous. 
if one of these people did try to raise their voice and bring light to some transgression performed by the administration or share information that isn't approved by the administration, their voice could be silenced, ensuring that the status quo is maintained, that those in power remain in power, and any violations or scandals or wrongdoings performed by them, even if it was hypocritical to their own belief system, goes unpunished. Thankfully, for most of us, this isn't a dystopia that we live in, but in the world of my friend Pedro, things are different. The internet is controlled by one person, a woman named Ophelia who is also known as the dictator of the internet. While exploring the disconnected tubes of her domain, Pedro and Ophelia herself provide various musings that paint a picture of Ophelia, one of narcissism, absolute power, and sadism, all traits typically associated with tyrants, and she does wield her power with an iron fist. With her control over the internet and the prevalence of the system in our everyday life, it's very likely that Ophelia's rule over those in the world of my friend Pedro is absolute and part of the reason the world could be regarded as a dystopia. Very clearly, the developers are saying that if control of the internet falls under one body, they would use it the same way Ophelia does to ensure they never lose that power. And if control of the internet is ever centralized, we'll have to fight to wrest control of the resource back because internet freedom is absolutely vital to keeping our society running the way it does. Now, obviously, the story of my friend Pedro isn't meant to be a meta commentary on the social and economic issues that we are facing in our world today. I would point to the floating banana named Pedro as proof, but these little quips and funny caricatures help add a bit of depth to the world of the game and make it feel that much more real and relatable as we play through it. Hopefully, the issues we deal with in the real world don't ever get as ridiculous as they are in the game, and I think we can make sure that happens by all working towards building a world in which we can all lead happy lives. Do you see any parallels between the levels of my friend Pedro and the real world that I didn't cover? Do you have any questions about the things I raised? Feel free to share, I'd be happy to hear from you. But that's all for this one, so thank you for watching and see you later.